As always, I'm grateful for this opportunity to deliver a sermon, at least what I might consider a sermon. If you would be interested in following along, let us all turn over to the book of 2 Samuel, particularly chapters 11 and 12. We'll, we'll be spending a great deal of time there this morning. Throughout these chapters, we will note several things, but generally we'll find that King David finds himself conquered, led captive by his own lusts. Earlier in this book, we find him mourning for the death of King Saul and his beloved friend Jonathan. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, he there says, The beauty of Israel was slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. As we will study, King David's sin would indeed be published abroad to be in Israel. So his mourning for King Saul would very, very well apply to his own sin, to the account that we will soon discuss. Not only would it be published before all those in Israel of that, da of that time, but it's come down to us throughout the ages. We can turn to these pages, we can read it, we can study it, And this account, I would like to point out, is further evidence for the divine inspiration for the Bible itself. You see, David is an applauded man throughout Scripture. However, it is also recorded that he has committed grave faults. When you consider how humans write history, record events of history, Typically, its heroes are looked at, looked at as being great. They have no faults. Likewise, those who are considered the enemies or antagonists in any way would have all the faults. But you see, God in his recording through human hands does not spare detail. If his heroes committed faults, those are recorded as well. David is no exception. As we begin our study here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, <clears throat> we will consider David and Bathsheba's, Bathsheba's sin, beginning there in verses 1, reading through 5. It says, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab, and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide, that David arose from off his bed, and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived, and sent, and told David, and said, I am with child. You see, these verses point just how easily it is for us to fall into sin, to succumb to temptation. Now, it is interesting to see that that last sentence of verse 1 of chapter 11, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. You see, David chose not to go to battle. This was somewhat abnormal. Because of this, 
Clearly, King David had idle time on his hands. Idleness is a concern for us all. <clears throat> Amos chapter 6, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 15. Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37. And 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. It's been said before that idle hands are the devil's workshop. Jesus in Matthew 12 there says that we'll, be, we'll have to give an account of the idle words that we use. We'll be judged by them. No doubt are by our idle actions as well. David here is seeing this woman bathe. He succumbed to temptation. And that led to sin. But you see in verse 2 that David did not only look upon her. He kept looking. Instead of heeding the example of Joseph, he inquired about this woman, Bathsheba, verse 3. Instead, he should have ran away, returned to his bed, just as Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife, Genesis chapter 39, verses 11 through 13. You see, if King David had turned away, things would have ended much differently. Job chapter 31, verse 1. There it says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why should I think upon a maid? David should have been mindful of this principle. Unfortunately, at this time, King David's only concern was the gratification of his own flesh. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. It is at this point that David has ignored two opportunities of escape. You see, God provides us with methods of escape. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. He could have just as easily returned to his bed as he had, as he had gone to the window. Secondly, he could have heeded the words of the one who said, Is not this Bathsheba, Bathsheba daughter of Eliam? the wife of Uriah the Hittite? He should have been thankful for the boldness of that question being asked. Instead, he chose not to heed that warning. Then regarding Bathsheba, why was she choosing to expose herself upon this rooftop? Was she trying to seduce the king? Or was she guilty of accidental, indecent exposure? Regardless, women must be mindful of how they appear in public and even in private. Women must be careful so as not to dress to seduce others, especially men. Nowadays, with rampant homosexuality, we've got to be concerned about enticing and seducing those of our same sex. Either way, Bathsheba did not seem too concerned about this. She should have been much more discreet and aware of her surroundings. She was just as guilty as David. However, King David should have conducted himself as God's anointed instead of abusing his power which is exactly what he did so David brought him or brought Bathsheba to his house and there they fornicated and ultimately their sin found them out verses 4 through 5 we see there that Bathsheba was found with child no doubt this event brought them great anxiety. You see, under the law of Moses, committing adultery was a death sentence for both of them. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. Just as David and Bathsheba ignored the morality principles set forth by God, look around the world today. Is there really any care for biblical morals? By large, there's not. 
Fornication is rampant. Adultery is rampant. And a whole host of other immorality. Secondly, we consider the attempted cover-up by these two. Chapter 11, verses 6 through 13. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house, and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord, and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? And why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark, and Israel, and Judah, abide in tents, and my lord Joab, and the servants of my lord, are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him and made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his own house. Typically, when someone sins, or a group of people sin, how do they respond? They typically try to cover it up. We find that Adam blamed God. We see that Achan... And even his family hid the sin that he had committed. And we see here that David tried to cover up his sin. He does this by attempting to bring Uriah home. The purpose here would be that if he went and laid with his wife, Uriah would believe that this child was his. Uriah, however, was humble and loyal. Instead of doing this, he slept at the king's house. Now since this first attempt had failed, David implemented plan B. He got Uriah drunk. However, Uriah's will was still strong. He did not return home. He stayed at the king's house. You see, Uriah exhibited the attitude of a right-thinking David. We read it there in verse 11 of chapter 11 of how Uriah would, he couldn't do this thing of going home to his own house because his fellow soldiers were, were so deprived. Joab, his commander, was in battle. All of Israel and Judah were in battle. Why would he be considered special? Why should he have the benefit of returning home? We see this in in a right-thinking David later on in 2 Samuel chapter 24 where David is trying to buy the threshing floor there. And the king said unto Aranua, Nay, but I will surely buy it from thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. You see, a right-thinking King David understood sacrifice. If he was going to offer sacrifices to God, he wanted to actually sacrifice for it. Give up something that was precious to him. Uriah was doing exactly that. But this King David of chapter 11 could not see that. 
these two instances, both Uriah and older King David, both exhibited humility and the proper perspective. But in our context, David fails to do so. Thus, David's attempt at a cover-up fails. Then we see that King David plans a murder. This transpires throughout chapter 11, verses 14 through 25. We'll only read verses 14 through 17. There it says, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter, a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass, when Joab observed the city, that he assigned Uriah into a place where he knew the valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died also. Because the last two schemes of David failed, he plotted murder. And he makes sure that this murder will be carried out. After all, who better than Joab to perform this, this activity? Joab was a very ruthless man. Of course, he would make sure he died. Uriah ironically delivers the very letter that is his own death sentence from David to Joab, who is commander of Israel's army. In verses 18 through 21, we see the political mind of Joab. He here is re rehearsing with the messenger of what this man should be saying to King David. If David starts questioning, you know, why did we lose so many men in this attack? Have you not learned from history? And then Joab points out, if he gets mad, go ahead and bring up that Uriah died. That will make him feel better. But we see instead the response in verses 22 through 25. The messenger here delivers the news to King David. Verse 22, So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field. And we were upon them even un unto the entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from afar off upon the wall of thy servants. And some of the king's servants be dead. And thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. You see, King David was pleased with the results that he had just heard. And even more troubling, he is not shaken by the fact that some of his soldiers were killed as a result of this planned murder. Can you believe the amount of gall that David had at this point to make that statement? But this is what sin does to the rational mind if, let, if left unchecked. You see, it's it's changing him. We typically go to great lengths to make sure that our sin will not be found out. Next we see the, the following cover-up, plan C, if you will. David marries Bathsheba in verses 26 through 27. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife, and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Those are very powerful sentiments. Unfortunately, all too often, we ourselves are guilty of the same doing things that displease our Lord. 
Just why did David marry Bathsheba so quickly after the death of Uriah? Was it another attempt at a cover-up? It seems to be a self-imposed, if you will, shotgun wedding. You see, she was indeed with child. And if Uriah could no longer perform his duty as far as his role in the cover-up, their reasoning was, we must get married. But as we said, this event did not go unnoticed. Verse 27 says that God was sorely displeased with this event. <clears throat> now we must always keep in mind that our sin will always find us out. Numbers chapter 32 verse 23 and Isaiah chapter 59 verse 12. No matter the length we go to to attempt to cover it up, to make any kind of remedy that we think will work, eventually it will find us out. David had forgotten these things. Verse 12, however, begins with Nathan's reproval of David. Verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat, drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took of the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that was come to him. You see, Nathan knew exactly how to hit David. David's history, his upbringing, he was a shepherd boy. Thus we see verse 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. After all, that was a portion of the law of Moses to restore those things fourfold. Exodus chapter 22 verse 1. David knew very well about herding sheep, the importance of these animals. But we do see that he still had some remembrance of the law of Moses, for he is recalling them in his righteous indignation for this rich man. We must realize that David has remained impenitent for at least nine months. By this point, the baby has been born. Uh, verse 14 of chapter 12, 2 Samuel. And God is still displeased with David, with Bathsheba, with his situation. And as we've just read, Nathan, Nathan gives David this scenario of where a rich man abused his power and took advantage of a poor man, taking his prized ewe lamb. Verses 5 and 6 here, David unknowingly condemns himself. He was able to notice the mote in the rich man's eye. However, he overlooked the beam that was in his own eye. Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. And Luke chapter 6, verses 41 through 42. Thus, he was no better than that rich man in the, in the story. David then receives the horrifying words of condemnation. There in verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover given unto thee such and such things. You had everything, but if you still needed more, I would have given them to you. <clears throat> 
And you can look back and see how God, through providential care, had taken care of David. And you consider how many times Saul had wanted him dead and attempted to kill him. Yet David prevailed. But he was the man. We would note that David was angry with this rich man and not with Nathan. Verse 5. Thankfully, Nathan had enough boldness and love for King David to tell him the truth, to tell him exactly what he needed to hear and how he needed to hear it. Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. God, through Nathan, condemns David the same way as King Saul was condemned. There in verse 9, which reads, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. The condemnation of, of King Saul can be found in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 19. But we see King David going down the similar path as King Saul did. Which should alert us that we can too. You see, both of these men were anointed of God. But through process of time and their own lusts and their faults, they allowed sin to take over. And they did not take the proper actions to remove those sins. You see, King David had sown to the flesh. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. There Paul pens, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And consider Hosea chapter 8 verses 6 through 8. In our text this morning we see that David had sown to the flesh. And as a result he would reap corruption. We see in verse 10 here that the sword would not de de uh, depart from the house of David. This great sin between David and Bathsheba would bring about the deaths of four others. Verse 18, it would bring about the death of the baby that they conceived out of wedlock. Ammon would be killed by Absalom for raping Tamar. 2 Samuel chapter 13 verse 32. Absalom, Absalom would eventually die at the hands of Joab, 2 Samuel chapter 18, verses 14 through 15. And David's son Adonijah killed, would eventually be killed by Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 25. And then you consider the different rebellious acts by his own children. Sin always brings about trouble. Though this sin was committed in private, God promised it would be brought out in the public. He even says, in the sight of this son, verse 11, and then repeats it in verse 12. For thou didst in secretly, but I will do this thing, this thing before all Israel and before the son. Verse 12 again. These things will be brought to light. This was such a grievous sin because King David was a leader. Verse 14, the first portion of that. Howbeit, because by, thy, by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You see, when a leader sins, its enemies take notice. If this anointed one of God can sin what do you think opens what do you think that opens the door to God here says blasphemy we we see the same thing happen with the children of Israel at Mount Sinai they were naked before their enemies the enemies of Israel have already taken note of their immoral behavior we know also that sin is a reproach to any nation Proverbs chapter 14 verse 34 and we know the severity of when leaders sin, just as the sons of Eli, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses, verse 17 and 24. 
how they caused the people to sin. We see, though, that the, the message of the prophet Nathan pricked David's heart. David repented as a result. It is because of this that he is considered a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. And Acts chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. As we bring this lesson to a close, we need to keep in mind that this account is written for our learning. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Each and every one of us should be grateful for the Nathan in our lives. This individual or these, these individuals love us enough to tell us the truth that we so desperately need to hear. Now even more important than having a Nathan is having the ability to self-diagnose. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. We as individuals bear the responsibility of keeping our own selves pure. David did not do that. So at that point, he needed a Nathan to come in and point out his wrongdoing. We must give diligence to remain pure of all sin. You see, not only does sin put our own soul in jeopardy, but it could cause others to stumble, cause others to sin. And even at our repentance, there are consequences that still remain. As we saw with King David and Bathsheba, their action ultimately caused the death of four others. We must also be wary to make sure that we do not allow ourselves to have a seared conscience. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. King David was on the verge of having one. You see, the Christian should have the same attitude as David as recorded for us in the book of Psalms. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4. In writing about this, this event that we've just studied this morning, Paul there sa or David there says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. You see, God has offered a way for the Christian to remove their sin. That is repentance and prayer. God had the opportunity before David to repent of his sin. That, that came through Nathan. Ultimately and finally. We today need to repent and pray of our sin. Confess our sins and pray that we will be forgiven. 1 John chapter 1 verses 7 through 9. But for those outside of Christ... You currently have no hope. But why not put on Christ through baptism? Galatians chapter 3 verse 27. Just because you have no hope right now doesn't mean you have to remain in that state. You can become a Christian through obedience to the gospel. Beginning your biblical faith. Growing your belief in Christ as the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 17. John 8 24. Repenting of your sins, Acts 3.19. Confessing Christ before others, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. And at that point, you are a candidate for scriptural baptism. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Why not put on Christ in baptism today if you've not already done so? If you are a child of God and through your own lusts have allowed sin to take effect, to take homage in your life put that sin away this morning through repentance and prayer whatever your need may be please make it known as together we stand and sing